I'm glad to welcome Jane Caruthers, who is research professor at the uh, University of South Africa and has been the keynote lecturer of this uh, Six Soldier Symposium for this interview for HALAC, the uh, Review of Soldier, Historia Ambiental de Latino America e Caribe. And I wanted to ask Jane, uh, you have written extensively about nature conservation. Could you outline for our audience the existing links between colonialism and conservation? Yes, but before I do, can I just say what a pleasure it has been to be part of the Salcha Conference, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here and to see uh, a little bit of Colombia. Uh, yes, that is a question that I think goes to the heart of environmental history um, in places that were colonized. And rather than nature conservation, maybe one should speak about the conservation of natural resources, because that is what colonialism is about. It is about taking resources from local people, wherever they were colonized, and deciding what would be protected, what would be conserved, and indeed what would be used and who would use them. So I think it's about the appropriation of natural resources, which is what colonialism was about as an institution, and its legacy has been critical for all countries that were colonized. Um, some of the, the uh, 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 natural resources that were conserved have been protected in protected areas, and the legacy and the, uh, the d divisions and the contests over that have perhaps shaped some of the politics of co co previously colonized um, countries. I also think that the legacy of colonialism and conservation can be seen in the philosophies around, uh, around uh, how the natural world works. Firstly, ideas around desiccation, were countries drying up, if you deforested them, what were the philosophies about who could grow their crops and where. I think those sorts of issues have been part of the top-down colonial order that many countries around the world have inherited. The other legacy of colonialism has to do with um, the fact that there is still powerful groups and groups that are less powerful and it is those who have fewer access to resources that are generally the less powerful. So I think that the intellectual and the political and the biological um, importance of colonial and conservation cannot be overestimated. Thank you. And uh, to go even beyond this, uh, these topics, in, our, in your 2009 inaugural lecture as a professor at yeah. the University of South Africa, you compared environmental history and ecology as disciplines in yes. very different fields but with similar aims. Could you uh, expand this well, metaphorical <laughs> comparison? Yes. Well, it is metaphorical because I have ecologist friends who would not agree that um, ecology and environmental history had anything in common, but I think what uh, the vision of environmental history that I have is as a discipline that can be compared with ecology, which after all brought a whole lot of specialization together. Um, the botanists had to work with the zoologists and the climate change so that in fact you understood a whole landscape. And in a way that's what I think that aspects of environmental history can do. We've taken political history and we've put it with agrarian history. We've particularly put it with social history and the history of the underclass. So I suppose if it's a if one can look at ecology as being an overall understanding of a landscape, that's what I think that we should do as environmental historians. That doesn't mean that there are not specializations or that everybody has got to be a kind of a generalist, but I think the idea of looking at the whole picture is something that is very particular to environmental history and something that makes it a very powerful way of understanding different histories and different parts of the world. Yeah, and uh, so environmental history becomes uh, central in understanding also ecology. <laughs> so what role do you envision for environmental history in the current debates about environmental crisis, climate change, uh, and about possible social political solutions? Well, I don't know that we historians are the solution finders. and. Sometimes when we are asked to be judges, um, we don't do a very good job. I also sometimes do not think that historians who are called on 
to use the past as a lesson for the present, I don't think that that works very well either. But what it does seem to me is that there are politicians and social scientists who are commenting on certain aspects of the environmental crises that we have. Climate change is one. I think that the hard scientists are also saying things. But there isn't a, there isn't a humanities discipline yet that kind of pulls this together and and make sense of it and that's what I think we our role is I think we should be more public about it I think we need to write more for the newspapers to be critical about what climate change means for people not only for the planet but bringing it down to um, to the level of specific societies in specific places maybe you can say it's a way of making sense of the science making sense of the politics but there is definite role that there are a lot of platitudes, mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways of shorthand, and I think that it is our, our goal as historians to make that more complicated. But also, because we tell stories, because we put it in language, um, we can be very powerful in that regard, and I don't think that our voices are sufficiently heard. I think maybe, maybe we don't do enough, but I also think maybe we're not asked enough. Thank you. You're, you're also president of ISO, the International Consortium of Environmental, yes. His, environmental yes. History Organizations, which uh, could be a voice in these debates. Could you yeah. tell our audience what ISO is all about? And well, yeah, ISO does come out of the kind of philosophy that I've just mentioned in thinking of uh, uh, comparing us a bit with ecology. ISO, which is the International Consortium of Environmental History Organizations, I see as a kind of federation. It isn't an organization for individuals. You don't belong as a person, but your organizations belong. And there was a gap, perhaps, for a federal organization to exist that brought these organizations together. Now, some of them are academic organizations. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like SOLCHA or the Environmental History Organization for Europe and America. But there is also a place in ISO for publishers who work on environmental um, journals and books. I think there's also a place for history departments and universities that have got strong environmental and environmental history departments and faculties. So as a as a hub, as a way of bringing all of these um, institutions together. That is what I would like ISO to do. It's, um, mm -hmm, it's an organization in the making, so we have a chance to shape it. But what has happened so far is that there, are, there is a constitution, so there are rules, there are ways of joining for uh, people who would like to donate a lot of money, who would be called leading institutions, but there are also very small institutional fees for um, organizations like SOLCHA or others, um, history departments, so that there are various ways of belonging. Um, the ISO's big, um, uh, what can one say, big goal is to have a five-year World Congress. And we have had one, and it came out of that that ISO was founded. There is going to be another one at the University of Minho in northern Portugal in 2014 um, in July which we are promoting we would like that to be a real focus and uh, it's the, the title of it uh, thanks to Angela Mandonka who put the proposal forward is called environmental history in the making I also think that it could be international environmental history organizations in the making because we need them to work together to make a successful Congress every five years there will be lots of um, activities. We want to get into environmental education. The politicians in Gamaranj in northern Portugal would like us as a World Congress to energize the schools, to energize the politicians. So we've got a big job to do in Portugal and I think that that's going to be very important. But we can also act as a kind of a post box. Um, I'd like to start uh, links to um, online journals uh, like Halak. I'd like also to have links to um, important um, government and policy documents. So we would welcome um, suggestions from people as to how we can better do this um, with limited resources and limited personnel. Um, we're all volunteers. We all have our own 
jobs to do and our own research to do, but I think it is important for us um, to create um, a really powerful intellectual space where environmental historians can all share their ideas. And when I say that, I mean research ideas as well as organizational ideas. So actually a space to further environmental history at a global level. That is exactly it. And coming back from the global level to a not so local but a little bit more local, <laughs> what's your take on well, how is l how healthy is Latin American environmental history and wow. how have you what do you think about it after the two and a half days yes, of I've been conference? Oh, well, it, it, it isn't local, as you say, <laughs> sort of local, <laughs> because it is huge. I mean, in geographical area, but it is also very wide ranging in um, historiography and methodology as well. I think I don't speak Spanish, but I can read the titles <laughs> of the... Uh, of the talks and the papers and I can meet people socially and talk to them and it seems to me that there's this is a very very vibrant powerful exciting energetic field and there are many many people working students um, people in their middle careers people coming to the end of their careers looking at a wide variety of things I'd say that it is more varied maybe than American environment, North American environmental history. It is certainly more exciting because there is much more of a, of a program of, of um, improving society. Sorry, I've just looked up and seen a lovely bird. Sorry, that's <laughs> another kind of environmental history. But I have really been extra extraordinarily impressed and I think that we need to work out a way of um, presenting this kind of research um, not only in the Spanish-speaking world, but making the English-speaking world more aware of it without um, translating everything into English or whatever. But I think we need to think about how to bring this really, really wonderful scholarship that is being done to more public attention. And to close, I will pose you a question that I know you are not so convinced about, but uh, what is there anything like a specific environmental history of the emerging world, as you meant, as you called it in your yeah. um, keynote lecture? Because you are an expert in South African and Australian, yeah. which are not emerging world. No. So Australia is definitely not emerging yeah. world in any it's sense. That's an interesting question, Wilco, because I think that it is often thought of as a north-south debate, and Australia and New Zealand are certainly south, but they don't have the Mm, the emerging world challenges that we have of poverty, of huge slums around cities, people who live without water, who eke out a living by selling little trinkets and bits of food at the, on the pavements and sidewalks and things. I th and we, they don't have filthy cities where the sewerage doesn't work, where the manhole covers are stolen. Those are emerging world and they don't have the biodiversity in the same way as we, as we have it, I think, in, in certainly in Africa and in Latin America. So I think that their issues are different. They're exciting. They're about sort of uh, a British colony coming to grips with um, a really strange and, and wonderful environment. Um, so it's like, do we belong? Or don't we belong? Those seem to be the big issues in, in, um, in Australian environmental history. And also, I think a lot of the work has to do with finding out what the appropriate scientific um, responses are to an Australian environment. For the emerging world, as I would understand it, coming from Johannesburg and as the kind of things that I'm listening to here, I'd say that there is a, a stronger focus on a social program for the emerging world, whether it's in the Northern Hemisphere or in the South, than Australia. But that doesn't mean that we can't all have a conversation because I don't really believe in comparisons, like this is the same and this is the yeah. same. But what comparisons do do is that they make you think, hmm, what's different about us? What's different about them? And that is where our research questions come from. So although they're not quite the emerging world, I think that these non-Western environmental histories are critically important. Thank you, Jane. I'm yeah. sure the, all the audience of Halak will regret to enjoy this interview and all the insight you gave us about the colonialism, conservation, the emerging world and 
what ICO is. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Vilka, for those questions and for the opportunity to do this. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.